Rejoice and be glad. Your reward will be great in heaven. Alleluia. 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 The Lord be with you. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Matthew. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain. And after he had sat down, his disciples came to him. He began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are they who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the land. Blessed are they who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they will be shown mercy. Blessed are the clean of heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are they who are persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. <coughs> Blessed are you when they insult you and persecute you and utter every kind of evil against you falsely because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward will be great in heaven. The Gospel of the Lord. I have to begin this homily with a, a little bit of a confession. Whenever I came across uh, uh, the gospel for today and in preparing for the homily, I have to admit I had a tendency to say, oh, Lord, the Beatitudes. <laughs> Like, again, <laughs> like always preaching on the beatitude. The other one is the, uh, the sower and the seed. I feel like that just comes up so many times. Um, and uh, immediately I had to check myself. Like, okay, why did I respond that way, Lord? Um, sometimes, you know, it can be uh, there's a gospel that's maybe challenging to us. And when we come across it, we're like, you know, I don't want to hear that. Um, uh, and even though there's plenty to challenge us in the beatitudes, I knew that that wasn't what was resonating in my heart. And I realized that, the Beatitudes, in some ways, are too familiar to me. In other words, I don't really know them and ponder them the way that I should, but it's something that I hear often. I've heard it even whenever I was a Protestant, and you know, lots of little, uh, you know, cheesy paintings with flowers and stuff, and the Beatitudes are written on them. And I, I think that there can be a way that we as Christians sentimentalize something like the Beatitudes or the other sayings and teachings of Christ and can in a very subtle way forget the radicalness of what is being preached to us by Christ, what is being revealed to us by the Father in Him. And whenever we come across scriptures, uh, Christian sentiments that uh, seem perhaps too sentimental or too familiar to us, it is always in every case going to be an invitation for us to revisit the radicalness of what is being communicated to us in the gospel. Now with the Beatitudes, to be honest, it's really not that hard. So why, you know, blessed are the meek, they're going to inherit the land, blessed are those who are you're sorrowful, they're going to be comforted, you know, that's all well and good. But you get down to the last ones, it's like, whoa, this is heavy. <laughs> Blessed are those who are persecuted in my name. There are certain aspects of the Christian faith that you and I all too easily like to overlook. Uh, we don't really want to embrace the gospel as proclaimed in its reality by Christ because it upsets the status quo. And yes, even the living out of the Christian faith in certain times and places and cultural contexts can become the status quo. Now you and I, if we are not well aware, we ought to be, that we are living in a culture where Christianity is not really the status quo anymore. And that an authentic embrace 
of the gospel will lead to persecution. Again, as I've said before, at least on Facebook and Twitter, um, uh, it may get to such extreme positions that you lose your job uh, because people think you're a hater and they're gonna do everything to ruin your reputation. But the real aspect of our faith that's being challenged in this gospel is the absolute necessity that you and I place our hopes on something that cannot be seen in the here and now and only be experienced by the eyes of faith and by the theological virtue of hope. In other words, everything about the Beatitudes, everything about the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ points to a time in the future when we will receive as a gift from Him eternal peace, eternal comfort, a place in heaven and even a new earth will be established by him. And it is then and only then that you and I will be able to experience the peace, the joy, the comfort that we actually long for now and so often wrongly seek in the things, the places, the circumstances of this world. What is so radical about what our Lord is proclaiming uh, uh, to us in the Beatitudes is that while he asks us to go about our duties, while he asks us to work <laughs> hard, especially in alleviating uh, the sufferings and, and comforting others, that ultimately you and I as Christians, if we do not make our peace with the fact that our heart will not be fulfilled, that our desires will not be met authentically, until we pass from this life to the next, we are going to constantly not be at peace. We are constantly going to be in turmoil and conflict, not with the world, but with God himself. Because in our fallenness, in our brokenness, we too often seek the world. And we seek to obtain peace, comfort, and joy by its methods, by its ways and it will fail us every time. I think the Beatitudes can be a very powerful examination of conscience for us as Christians. We often still live uh, our faith as if we're in the Old Testament. And to be honest, we actually often don't even live it as well as they did in the Old Testament. Normally, they weren't really bickering with God, say, about the content of the Ten Commandments, which we in our modern era are want to do regularly and even Christians rationalize rejecting uh, the moral law and the teachings uh, of our Lord uh, and his church. But even if we haven't done that, we enter into our experience of the faith as the mere avoidance of evil, the mere avoidance of getting smacked down by God, who, to be honest, we probably still don't quite trust. You know, it's like, okay, well, he's, he's bigger and more powerful than I am, so I'm not going to give him lip about this or that, and I'm going to try and, you know, toe the line. But we're not really entering into the truth that Christ came to reveal to us, that if we are patient, if we trust him perseveringly, while perhaps we undergo sorrowfulness, as perhaps in being humble and meek, we surrender a portion of the land of our material comfort or wealth or emotional preferences so that someone else can experience a, a certain degree of peace and comfort and joy. If we accept persecution for his name, there will come a time where he will definitively wipe away every taint of sadness, sorrow, sin, anger, anything negative that you and I can imagine will not only be wiped away, but we will experience a peace, a comfort, a joy, a happiness that we cannot imagine. But it does absolutely 100% require us to trust that God is good enough to give that to us. And furthermore, that his call to avoid sin, that his call to even sacrifice lovingly the good things of this earth for the sake of his kingdom is not an arbitrary command on his part, but is a very uh, uh, aspect of his love. It's the very nature of his love to sacrifice and to give ourselves as a gift. And in a fallen world, that hurts. 
And you and I as Christians have to be careful that we are not uh, uh, in, in very subtle ways betraying the truth of this gospel by comforting our sorrows illicitly, by being selfish, by not trusting the Lord whenever he may ask us to make sacrifices or when he asks us to carry certain pains and certain crosses, not trusting him whenever we are persecuted for the sake of his name and beginning to wonder, oh, well, is he wrong? Or more likely, just making up a version of Jesus that fits with what those who are persecuting us would like to hear about. You know, that's the new paganism uh, or the new idolatry is that uh, we make up our own version of Christ that gives us the comforts of this world rather than the one who asks us lovingly to forgo those comforts that we may receive the comforts of eternal joy in heaven. As we receive the gift of our Lord's glorified body, blood, and soul and divinity. By the way, what we are receiving from this altar is the very reality that the Lord will experience for the rest of eternity by his Father's side in heaven. The Son of God, who did not have a body according to his nature, took upon himself one in time. That body suffered everything that you and I can suffer on the cross and then was raised again in glory. He ascended into heaven and he will be in heaven with his glorified body for all eternity, bearing witness to the fact that that is our destiny. Let us, with the eyes of faith, ask him for the grace that we would learn to receive our comfort from him, that we would not allow our hearts, our minds to be distracted and preoccupied with the comforts and pleasures of this world, but that we would truly hope in him and that we would be willing to suffer the pains and sorrows uh, uh, that are, that are uh, a part of his providence for the here and now because of sin, knowing that he will set us free in the fullness of time. Our Lord does indeed want to grant us peace now. He does want to give us comfort now. It's just not the type of peace and the type of comfort that you and I clamor for if we have not allowed our hearts to be transformed by Christ. It's a more profound, it's a deeper comfort that can maintain its peace even while hanging on a cross. Our Lord wants to deliver us from sin. He wants to deliver us from death. And in time, he wants to deliver us from every taint of sorrow. Let us ask him today for the courage, the strength to place our hopes in him that we may be with him and his Father in the Spirit for all eternity.